Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, The Growing Success of Nonprofits and Saving City Services. So just so you know, this session is being recorded and will be posted to our UCI DC On Demand Recordings page as well as YouTube. And you will also receive a copy via email to the email you gave us when you registered for the webinar. So my name is Jessica Love. I am a program representative for education and business programs at UCI Division of Continuing Education. I'm going to quickly go over our nonprofit management specialized studies program before introducing today's guest speaker. Zoom has a chat feature that you can use to ask questions. If you have technical issues, please direct those questions to John from UCI. If you have any questions for our panelists, please submit your questions in the chat panel to all panelists. We're going to try to address your questions throughout the presentation, and we're also going to save a few minutes at the end to answer any questions. So a little bit about our program. Um, nonprofit management it, in the 21st century is a promising, challenging career that requires professional skill in organization management and relationship building. Individuals working in mission-focused and value-based organizations must have a thorough understanding of internal and external factors affecting fundraising, as well as the ability to apply principles of marketing, communications, and strategic planning to the specialized profession. The Nonprofit Management Specialized Studies Program is designed to help you take a more proactive approach to the organizational needs and activities of both large and small nonprofit organizations, after the completion of this program, students can expect to have the knowledge base and skills to contribute to high-functioning nonprofit teams and productive fundraising operations. So we've designed this program for a couple of different types of people. For nonprofit staff members and development staff who are looking to move up into management positions, um, for volunteer coordinators, and then for career changers who are looking to pursue their passion in the nonprofit sector. So our program is broken down into seven required courses. And in order to receive the specialized study certificate, you have to receive a grade of C or above in all courses. So for our nonprofit management specialized studies program, there is a total of seven required courses listed here. We have a nonprofit management fundamentals class that we recommend everyone start with. We also offer classes in fundraising, financial management, stakeholder holder and board management, strategy, human resources, and marketing and communication. Students can take any combination of the courses that they like, but as I mentioned before, the certificate is only awarded upon completion of all required courses. So we have two classes coming up for spring 2019. Um, these classes are starting, um, I'll go over the start dates for these classes. The first is our nonprofit management and fundamentals course. It's starts on April 22nd and will go through June 9th. We're also offering our nonprofit strategy course. This course is going to start on May 6th and will run also through June 9th. Um, all of our courses are $475 per course, which makes this total cost with course fees for the program $3,360. Um, some courses may require textbooks. That estimate doesn't include the cost of textbooks. Um, we encourage students to buy their textbooks from their uh, bookseller of their choice, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, whatever works for you. Um, as you can see here, not every class is offered every quarter, so please plan accordingly. Any course that's less listed as to be scheduled is what we plan to offer in future quarters. So like I mentioned before, the, uh, the course here are the total course fees and then the mention about the textbooks. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our webinar presenter today, um, Mr. Andy Ramirez. He is the superintendent for um, public works in the city of San Jacinto. So give me one second. I'm going to give control over to Andy. Thank you, Ms. Love, uh, and hello to everyone uh, on the webinar. Uh, my name is Andy Ramirez, 
And uh, I have the privilege of currently uh, directing the operations uh, for the uh, streets, uh, parks, facilities, uh, which is uh, going to be our emphasis uh, during this webinar. Um, I also oversee the security patrol and stormwater divisions uh, for the city of San Jacinto. And um, I welcome you to the growing success of nonprofits and saving city services. And so um, as we move forward to this uh, next slide here, just wanna remind everybody that you can ask questions uh, throughout uh, our webinar today. And so we're getting our bearings here and uh, going on to our next slide. And so we're gonna test this guy out here. Uh, this just gives you a brief <coughs> background uh, regarding me. Um, you'll see that I also have experience with uh, fundraising and operations at, uh, at other nonprofits. And so being in city government, um, uh, I have a keen sense of uh, what a public-private partnership looks like and the needs for it. And so um, I just want to encourage you to let you know that uh, there is a lot of hope for nonprofits to make connections uh, with uh, a local city, and we're going to be focusing in on that. Uh, on our next slide, I want to make sure that uh, we kind of set the basis here on um, our webinar. Um, our next slide here <clears throat> is going to uh, share with you um, uh, what happens when the economy takes a downturn, um, uh, and how does that affect city services? So uh, before you is uh, a slide regarding a park called Salee Park. Um, it was one of the three uh, historical parks, if you would, at the city that uh, was fenced off to save money during the Great Recession uh, that we experienced uh, some years back. Um, building had stopped. Uh, the city uh, was uh, receiving less uh, uh, revenue through taxes because there was less jobs. Folks were not spending um, as they were previously. And so the overall tax base uh, really affected how the city was going to continue the ongoing uh, provisions for city services. Um, and that included facilities and um, uh, what they would offer uh, within those facilities. Uh, Hoffman Park, Mistletoe Park were other uh, victims, if you would, of a failed utility tax measure that would have brought in $5 million annually in city revenue. And so <clears throat> just to kind of give you a little bit more background, these parks, the reason why we're highlighting them in our webinar is because uh, they housed uh, very important facilities um, on the grounds. And so um, during this time, uh, 13 city workers were um, uh, laid off. Uh, police services and a fire station uh, were both um, uh, reduced dramatically in the city. And so high school students um, <clears throat> that used to go to Silly Park were part of a after school program called the Police Activities League Building uh, Program. And there they would get assistance with homework, uh, receive tutoring, um, some would have a meal. Um, it'd be a nice place for uh, um, young people to be able to um, just grow uh, in their education and do it in a safe place, especially since um, uh, parents would come home late. So this kind of acted as a, as a after school program. Uh, for many uh, young people. Um, now, one thing I wanted to mention is that not all of the parks in the city uh, were actually closed. Um, it was specifically these uh, parks um, that were part of uh, uh, the general fund. They were funded by the general fund and not any special tax district. Um, several new communities, um, when there's a park placed in the community, um, there will be a special tax specifically upon the property owners for those uh, new parks. Uh, but uh, some of these um, uh, generally funded uh, facilities um, were not able um, several years ago to be part of any special taxes. And so um, <clears throat> the recession obviously hit not only this city, but several others. Um, you could uh, do some research uh, 
on the city of Wildemar. Uh, they closed uh, uh, three parks uh, for five years. And so um, this was just a very difficult time uh, in the economy and it affected city services uh, <clears throat> holistically. Um, on our next slide here, um, I wanted to kind of share with you that the effects of, um, of closing down city facilities, uh, which also included the community center, um, uh, spread through the news. And so NBC got a hold of, of this communication <clears throat> back in uh, 2014. Um, and as you can see here, um, they, they published a, a picture of kids no longer playing uh, on the park. Uh, you can see there in the background, it was the fence. So kids were playing in the streets. And so it put a, 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 a somewhat of a smear on um, the, the city itself. And it was not that the, the city was requesting uh, for this reputation, it was just a sign of the times. And so uh, TV crews uh, uh, were recording children playing in the street. Um, the mayor at the time uh, said that the city was under a deficit of $5 million uh, caused by the recession. And so they had to make some deep cuts, uh, again, to public safety, facilities, and, uh, and parks. And so <clears throat> the city, um, uh, they failed at uh, passing uh, uh, some uh, ballot measures. And so um, that would have brought in that $5 million. It would have increased the, the utility tax by 6.5%. Uh, and so many people were uh, criticizing the tax um, because it was uh, considered a sliding tax. Uh, basically, if uh, your utility bill went up, your taxes went up. And so um, that didn't sit well with a, with a lot of people. And so it seemed very hopeless. It seemed that uh, there was no uh, end in sight. Um, uh, but something happened. And this is where those in the nonprofit world um, have the ability to do great things. And a few nonprofits came in partnership with the, the city. And so this next slide <clears throat> shares with you uh, one of the nonprofits that came alongside of the city. And <clears throat> this uh, picture before you is um, of a, a gym. So that uh, PAL building uh, that was closed down, the Police Activities League uh, building, was reopened uh, through Boxing for Christ. It was founded by a local mom uh, back in 2012, uh, Miss uh, Sonia Ramos. And the, the, the club, if you would, um, it was started as a club, but then it moved its gym to the uh, Salee Park facility, also known as the PAL building. And since then, some, some 700 students, um, uh, seven and older in age, have been through the program, uh, teaching respect, responsibility, uh, and, and a little bit of old school boxing. And um, this has been a, quite a remarkable um, a partnership. Uh, not only does the nonprofit <clears throat> uh, have a, a very great facility with restrooms, with lighting, um, with uh, uh, security and lighting, um, but then the, the city receives in return rent on the building, uh, uh, reduction of liability uh, on utilities, uh, reduction of, of having to pay staff to provide a program, and it was um, just a, a match made in heaven. Um, and so the picture before you is um, of a gentleman, uh, that a uh, young man that uh, uh, won the district and state and regional silver uh, glove boxing titles, and he qualified to compete uh, at the USA Boxing National Silver Gloves Tournament uh, in Missouri this past uh, January. And so um, what's, what's pretty unique about this is that um, the, the city was in a, in a place where uh, a building was ran down, if you would. Um, it was uh, abandoned. And here a nonprofit comes alongside to provide a service that uh, was very similar in nature and theme of the previous, 
but basically at no cost to the city. And so uh, nonprofits definitely have an ability to uh, not only save uh, services, but to increase the types of, of services that a city would like to, to, to provide. Uh, moving to our, our next slide here, I want to uh, share with you uh, some bullet points of those benefits uh, uh, that I uh, just touched on uh, previously. Uh, building maintenance uh, by the nonprofit is covered. Uh, so the city has very uh, uh, low uh, cost on any uh, maintenance uh, issues there. Um, again, there's a nominal rental fee paid by the nonprofit to the city. That's a huge benefit to the city, but then it's also a benefit to uh, the nonprofit uh, finding a building that is affordable. Uh, in today's uh, real estate, affordability for a nonprofit office or, or building um, is definitely uh, a golden nugget. Uh, utilities are paid for by the nonprofit. Security uh, alarms are paid by the nonprofit. So you can see the reduction of costs uh, for the, the, the local municipality. Um, the building of young people, uh, again, the self-esteem, uh, respect for others, uh, having goals uh, to represent the community and um, and then this also uh, provides for <clears throat> the businesses and residents to get invested into the facility. And uh, what better than to have the nonprofit uh, reach back uh, to the community and share what they're doing. And so um, this was uh, just definitely a, a really good uh, move in the right direction, uh, both for uh, the nonprofit and the local city. At the community center, uh, that was one of the other facilities located at uh, another park uh, called uh, Hoffman Park. And <clears throat> the community center completely shut down. In fact, the community center also housed the uh, city council chambers and that was closed down and, and moved uh, to the local school district. So you can kind of see how um, um, the, the funding mechanisms uh, that were once in place were not working uh, for the city. Um, but then there was a partnership that we were able to, um, to come across with uh, Family Service Association, uh, FSA. And they helped to basically reopen the city's community center and then provided even more um, uh, services. And so uh, FSA, uh, said, well, hey, how about we do this? Let's, let's man the building uh, Monday through Friday, and um, let's go ahead and start with providing breakfast and lunches for seniors. And uh, this was something that they were able to get grant funding um, and donors to provide. And then they operated, and they continue to operate uh, the community center. And so as an organization, um, they provide about 600,000 meals annually to their senior population, and, and we form part of that 600,000. And so the services um, uh, began to increase uh, there at the community center. Uh, FSA uh, provides uh, counseling, uh, anger management, uh, parenting uh, education. Um, they also provide meals <clears throat> that are delivered to homebound seniors. And uh, just a, a list of services that the city themselves uh, could not have um, devised up uh, and managed and operate as effectively as what we're seeing now with this nonprofit. Um, uh, we also see that uh, this uh, partnership, this public-private partnership, um, also allows for um, uh, seniors who are eligible to get guidance uh, for better housing, um, therapy uh, for those 60 and older, um, and also some basic health assessments and, and direction are given to them. Uh, this has also blossomed in other areas at the community center for the senior uh, population, uh, where arts and crafts um, are, are provided, um, uh, even uh, some food giveaway, uh, exercise classes, um, some basic clinics, and, 
things of that nature. I think that's uh, very important as our <clears throat> population uh, for our seniors um, continues to grow to provide some basic uh, health guidance and uh, diabetes prevention classes and what have you. And so definitely this uh, is another partnership where FSA provides a, 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 a fee to the city to rent out the facility at a very reasonable cost um, operate um, their nonprofit and at the same time um, reduce the amount of liability and maintenance uh, for the actual uh, city. Again, if you have any questions uh, so far, feel free to uh, uh, send those over. Uh, we'd love to get your questions and repeat them uh, to the team and uh, be able to, to answer your questions or any comments that you might have. Again, here are some bullet points. If you're taking any screenshots um, or jotting down your notes, um, this gives a, a pretty good detail on the benefits to the city from FSA. And um, I would just highlight <clears throat> that um, uh, uh, daytime security, uh, just having staff there and not having an abandoned building goes a long way. And in fact, um, it shows uh, the community that the city is alive and well and that um, services are being provided. Um, in fact, um, during hot weather, uh, the community center uh, provides a cooling center and during uh, very cold uh, winters, it uh, acts as a heating center. And so residents and, and, uh, and folks that uh, believe in what's happening in the community uh, see this partnership and are coming alongside of it. Uh, and so that uh, is a, a brief look at uh, two facilities. On our next slide here, um, I wanna kind of just take some time to uh, share with you um, practical steps that you can take with your own city. Um, you may ha have an idea that you're, you, you're saying to yourself, gosh, um, we really need this in our community. Um, um, or you have a special calling in, in being, to pro, being able to provide a service uh, for others. And so what I want to do is just encourage you to research the needs of where you live at. Uh, get to know the people uh, in your community. Um, uh, what can you do that is special um, uh, for uh, your community? Um, in fact, uh, just by speaking to your neighbors, speaking to local business people, um, uh, the chambers of commerce, um, uh, that will start unraveling or at least uh, start shaping um, your idea and then establishing your nonprofit. And then ask yourself uh, some questions. Uh, one of the questions that um, is pretty basic, but it's, it's foundational, is like, uh, you know, can my nonprofit meet a need now and how? Um, and so um, that, that takes a lot of internal thinking, but then also it takes um, part of the load off of potentially a, a city service that you could probably do better. Um, next, I would really encourage you to consider putting together your, your business plan um, or a simple uh, presentation. Uh, make make a, a presentation that you can share verbally in front of people, uh, a crowd of people, one-on-one, um, uh, -on -one, uh, a PowerPoint on what your nonprofit can do, and be as compelling uh, uh, in your presentation as possible. Um, uh, people really don't uh, know how uh, care how much you know and until they see how much you care and so if you can combine those two your knowledge and the passion that you have uh, to move forward your your nonprofit whether it's a small nonprofit a medium or large size nonprofit um, uh, the success or the ongoing success of any a nonprofit any business any service is the delivery and the communication uh, of what you're able to provide. 
and then start building those relationships with the Chamber uh, of Commerce. Um, I put in there tribes. Um, yeah, here in Southern California, believe it or not, there are several uh, Indian uh, tribes that um, have um, recently established their casinos and, and other businesses. And um, they are very uh, much open to uh, figuring out uh, how they can partner up with the local community and nonprofits. In fact, um, the local school district where I work at received a $1 million grant uh, from the Saboba tribe, and um, they were able to build a brand new pool, um, and uh, the tribe has done other uh, uh, donations, uh, pretty large donations. And so I just want you to kind of think outside of the box. Um, think, uh, think small, think big, uh, uh, think in every direction and build those relationships uh, with, uh, with local businesses. The next bullet point that you see here is uh, the relationship building with the local city council and city manager and his or her staff. Um, I think that um, uh, a very key dynamic here is that if there is a facility that can be used um, or service that can be provided, um, does require for there to be a level of uh, friendship, uh, a level of trust. And so get to know your local uh, city council members, the, the mayor, the mayor pro temp, um, uh, the uh, council members, and then the staff that actually um, is, is the staff in charge of the day-to-day -day operations for the city. And it's in those uh, conversations, it's in those uh, meetings um, that you'll be able to better hone in what you might be able to provide um, uh, your local community, or it may even have uh, you spur an idea of, of thinking deeper of changing how your nonprofit is actually operating. Uh, next, I would like to encourage you um, to not be afraid of fundraising. Uh, many folks uh, feel that uh, um, as if they were a used car salesperson trying to, uh, uh, to sell a lemon. But remember that your nonprofit is, has been established or is going to be established because you have something dynamic to offer. And so go after those grants, um, go after asking for donations. Um, in fact, um, Boxing for Christ uh, it receives grant funding from the local county and um, that helps them provide for their ongoing expenses. Um, really dig deep into uh, your local county uh, grant funds. Um, they are really a great hub of being able to direct you and give you guidance of what they have, um, especially since most of the time the state will kind of funnel uh, grants through the county. And so building those relationships there at the county, going there in person, um, getting on the website and see what they can offer. Um, on a local level, um, the facilities is, is one thing that you might want to look into at your local uh, municipality. And then maybe just have those conversations where there might be some internal funding to get uh, a relationship there started. Uh, finally, <clears throat> I would like to uh, encourage you to just research uh, low-cost city facilities and the options uh, to house your, your nonprofit. Um, if there is not a local um, uh, uh, municipality that has much facilities, um, <clears throat> you may want to consider looking at, at buildings that are, are there um, that are either vacant or abandoned or um, <clears throat> ask your, your local uh, city uh, uh, manager, um, is there other um, facilities within the area that you may um, give me some some guidance towards looking towards. And they may direct you to a city right next door that could really house your operations. And then that operations can then go ahead and um, spread its wings uh, to the neighboring um, uh, cities in the valley if you live there or in whatever region you might find yourself. 
At this time, I would like to open it up for uh, any, any questions, uh, any comments, uh, feel free. Uh, we'd love to, to hear from you uh, at this time. Okay, thanks so much, Andy. Um, looking to see if we have any questions coming in here. Um, one question I know I can answer is the type of instructors we have in our program. So all of our instructors are practicing um, nonprofit managers. A lot of them are uh, C level within their organization, and they're taking um, so they're taking that practical experience and they're trans uh, transporting or giving that information to our students and uh, sharing their knowledge, what's worked, um, their real life experience. So that's one thing I think is really great about our program. Um, Andy, I was in looking, kind of observing the PowerPoint. Um, I was gonna go back. So right here, for um, practical steps to partner with your city. Um, how, for a non, someone who's new to doing this and to working with a city, and reaching out to um, their city council and their city manager, would they? Would you recommend that they just go to the city council meeting, or would you recommend that they, you know, start meeting with council members like one on one, try to find like an advocate to help them get their program off the ground? Now, that's a great question. <clears throat> I would uh, definitely have you go to um, your local city's website. Um, most of the time, you will find an email address, uh, a phone number, and, um, and start there. Um, break the ice with uh, introducing yourself by email and or by phone, leave a message, um, and then also <clears throat> just request for a call back. Um, uh, most city council members um, are um, not only serving the city <clears throat> on a part-time basis, but they, they also have uh, regular jobs, and so, the response time that you might get back will may, may vary. Um, and then also at a city council meeting, uh, feel free to, to get there a little early, uh, maybe about you know 15 minutes early, and um, <clears throat> introduce yourself uh, if it's the right uh, environment and atmosphere to do it um, uh, beforehand, because many times city council members will um, just uh, shake hands with those in, in the audience. Or after the meeting, um, that might be another oppor uh, opportune time to speak to them and, and reintroduce yourself to them. And, uh, and those conversations, uh, I'll tell you one thing, they, they do lead to uh, a lot of encouragement. They lead to uh, at least interest to be, start to be built up. They may direct you <clears throat> to speak to somebody specifically at the city um, or connect the dots. And so, um, I really uh, encourage you not to be afraid uh, to do that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So we have another question about what can students expect from an online course. So one of our online DCE UCI courses, typically I tell students they can expect to spend six to 10 hours per week on um, per course on their online courses. And that includes things like reading assignments, viewing voice over PowerPoint lectures, um, doing any types of case studies or other work for the class. Um, there'll also be weekly discussion forums that students will be required to post to um, and respond to their classmates on. And typically our classes, um, they have weekly due dates and deadlines and then um, those assignments and materials are released on Monday, and then students will have access to those throughout the week, and they'll be able to log on, um, complete their assignments, and then on the next Monday, the next week of work will be released. Okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Andy, do you have any uh, closing thoughts you'd like to leave um, our listeners with? Yes. Um, one of the things that I want to encourage uh, those that are on the webinar is to then also reach out to other nonprofits. Um, there are folks that uh, uh, have been mentored by others, and that's why they've been successful. 
And, um, you know, it's, it's always a, a great opportunity uh, for someone who has received uh, guidance to then give guidance to uh, an upcoming nonprofit or somebody that's just looking into that in more depth. Um, it, it may be um, within the same uh, field of nonprofit uh, work that you're doing. Uh, I'd encourage you to do that. But then also think outside of the box and, and, and uh, make a phone call to another organization and see what they're doing because you may just get that spark that will lead to either a greater relationship um, with uh, uh, your local city or it may uh, just spark another idea of increasing funding for your nonprofit. And so um, uh, spread your net so that you can uh, be a great asset for your nonprofit. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy. Um, thank you again for your time and thank you for everyone who logged on and participated today. Um, and if you have any questions, I've put up my contact information here. Um, my email and phone number are there as well as my program manager, Lisa, her email and phone number there, and then also our website if you're interested. So th again, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your Friday.